commitment and hopefully your optimism. But this is really an important and key role that we've asked this group to take on as a responsibility along with the comments, concerns, and thoughts that all of our residents of Somerville have about the future of the Union Square area, and particularly a discussion about the needs of that area and how they can best be realized over time that reflect the needs of the community, both from the point of view of the residential areas, the economic development opportunities that are there. Uh, in planning this opportunity to get together, uh, Mayor Curtitoni reached out to Chris Leinberger, who you've met, I think many of you met today and have met on a previous occasion, and asked Chris uh, to join us and to bring with him and his colleagues their thoughts about an approach that we should consider taking about defining our needs and opportunities and start to, to take a look at the structure of a response to these needs. We anticipate, all of us anticipate, great futures for the Union Square. Change will occur. Change can be complex. And the pace of change can sometimes be frightening. We need to take this time, working with Chris's help, to talk about the important issues that we're all very aware of every day. As we invite investment in our community, there is a call and a response, and there are challenges, and we need to work together to meet those challenges. Now, for those of you who don't know Chris, uh, Mr. Leinberger has been and is the chair of the Center for Real Estate and Urban Analysis at George Washington University. He's, he's here also, uh, again, in his leadership of the Locust Group as president of Locust. Um, Chris is described in his biography as a land use strategist, teacher, developer, researcher, and author who balances business realities with social and environmental concerns. And I think that's all very impressive. And thank you, Chris, for joining us. But what Chris also is about, and I hope you understand that and you'll learn even more during these discussions, is that Chris understands the value of the urban environment, but the challenges of the urban, knowing who your neighbor is, enjoying each other's company, looking out for one another, looking out for safety, affordability, economic opportunity, and vitality. Chris found some of it before we found him, and he has been an outspoken supporter of everything we're doing in Somerville to make Somerville more of a walkable, livable city. So it is our great pleasure and Mayor Curtis Tony's specific pleasure to invite Chris to help us to move through a process that we believe will have the greatest impact and long-lasting results, positive results for our city. Chris Langer, thank you very much. Thank you so much. We have to speak in, into these mics, unfortunately, because it's being recorded. Um, okay, now I'm on. Okay. So, um, we're here to figure out where you're going, where you want to go, and, how do you, and, and, then, and then how do you get there. And this is your strategy. This is got to be yours only. So if you screw it up, it's your fault. Um, but you won't. Because we're in a really fabulous time in this country. Best time in my lifetime. Where the market and all of us want walkable urban communities to be resurrected. And that's why you're here. I, I assume that's why most of you live in summer though anyway. Because that's the that's the character of the place. And that now, though, a lot of other people want this same thing. And there's so many positive things that are going to happen as a result. And from a social equity point of view, from a environmental point of view, and from an economic point of view. <laughs> this is weird. OK. So I want to walk through a few introductory comment and let you know what, so the goal here is for you to figure out what the economic and community benefit strategy is for Union Square. 
and Boynton Yards. And also to figure out how to implement it. So it's not just figuring out what you want, but it's figuring out how you implement it. And it's for all of Union Square. It's not for the, the Union Square partners, US2, uh, for their tracts of land. It's for all of Union Square. Number two is that you strategy leaders have been given the responsibility to figure out how you reach that goal. It's your responsibility to figure out how to reach that goal. This is more how to than where you're going. You know, it's, it is both and, but without the how to, a strategy just floats, doesn't do anything. It's based upon a lot of work that you've done already. So a lot of the visioning, obviously summer vision, the neighborhood plan, you just received yesterday the fiscal impact work, which was the best news I've heard in a long time because it was to my way of thinking. If you've not seen it, you'll see it today. It's, it's, it's very positive. It, it's in front of you. Is it stacked up here? It hasn't been re released, but we're going to be talking about it. This afternoon is being released. Okay. Um, you're going to see it because it's critical for you to see it because you're at the big person table because in the real world, if you don't have the numbers and the financial trade-offs, you can't really make a decision. It's somewhat akin to when you bought your first house and you say, I'd like a, you know, a big house and lots of bedrooms and a swimming pool and all the rest. And, and then they say what price it is and you say, oh, I guess I can't afford that. Unless you have the numbers, you can't make that decision and you're gonna have those numbers. And you've, you've had a lot of work done by the CAC over the last couple of years. And that, all this is building upon that. Union United has been leading a, a effort to get a lot of grassroots support into the process. And they've come up with some very good ideas about the kind of community benefits that, that, that need to be part of this process. We're also gonna be discussing a briefing book that, that that Victoria has primarily been putting together, but it summarizes everything that you've been working on for the last two years. And that these, it's, it's important to also note that there's a lot of community benefits that we want to talk about and figure out, that you want to figure out. And it is going to be paid for by the economic success of Union Square. So there's a direct connection between the economic success and the kind of community benefits that you can afford. So that's why the fiscal impact is so important. You're looking at this holistically, not just focusing on community benefits by themselves, but not thinking about how you pay them. And so um, we're facilitating this. And who is we? Locus is part of Smart Growth America, a nonprofit focusing on promoting, advocating for walkable urban transit-oriented development. And um, we, and it needs to be mixed income. It can't be golden ghettos, because we believe that walkable urban places are, and, and this is, from my point of view, this is my reason for being involved with this. This is the number one way we're going to grow that we're, we in this country are going to address climate change. That walkable urban places have anywhere from 50 to 80 percent less greenhouse gas emissions than fringe development. And the more we do of it, the more we're going to address climate change, which to me is the number one issue we're dealing with. But it's, and therefore it's got to be mixed income. That if it is does not, if it's not, if it's just for thirty percent that can afford it, and seventy percent have to drive in, that doesn't do you any good. It must be mixed income. Um, so I've been knocking around this. Uh, I want to introduce the team here. Victoria, you've met Victoria uh, McGuire has been. She's the state director of uh, Locus, and Christopher Coase is the managing director of Locus. 
Um, I want them to say a couple words about the, their own background. The relevant background that I'm bringing to this table is doing a lot of consulting over many, many years to cities, developers, nonprofits to figure out what they should build and what they, you know, what's the strategy of their towns, of their downtowns. And I've also been a developer and things like, such as I started a nonprofit development company for UC Irvine in California to build a thousand <laughs> affordable housing units, which, has, which continue to be quite successful. Um, was a civic developer in my hometown as the chairman of the Metropolitan, um, uh, the Metropolitan Redevelopment uh, Commission that we bought 50 acres, that was the old railway yard, and we did a community process to figure out what to do with it. Then we set up a nonprofit development corporation and it's now built out, it's finished. Parks, open space, the farmer's market, all sorts of retail. I've done a lot of work on turning around downtowns uh, as a developer and was involved in downtown Albuquerque, redeveloping that when it was dead and flat on its back. But I've also done a lot of strategy work that you're looking to do here. And places like Chattanooga, which was a rust belt town that was ready to blow, uh, uh, it just was not moving at all. And downtown Chattanooga is one of the finest small town downtowns today through a lot of civic commitment to make it happen. But the same is true work I've done in downtown Lancaster, downtown of Detroit, which the strategy has now been implemented. They're moving on to the next phase of it. It's a remarkable downtown turnaround that, that people, even some people fail to realize just what's happening in downtown Detroit right now. So I've been involved with this kind of thing a lot, but it's never been my strategy. It's your strategy. Because you, you all live here. I don't. So you care about it. Um, this is now my academic think tank phase of life, as Michael mentioned, involved with the Brookings Institution of Think Tank as a senior fellow, uh, GW, and president of, uh, of the Locus. And um, so all of this stuff comes together here in a place like Somerville because what we're hoping to do is this becomes a national model of an economic development strategy that drives a social equity outcomes and that is fiscally responsible. That's what the, that's what the hope is. So, Victoria, I want to give a little background on yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Victoria McGuire. Um, as was mentioned, I'm the Massachusetts State Director for LOCUS. Um, but my background is in public policy and in urban planning. And I got involved in urban planning uh, at the start of my career when I was working as a legislative aide uh, in Dorchester. And almost a very similar situation was occurring around Ashmont Station. The MBTA was going to reinvest in Ashmont Station, but the, the plan, as I saw it, was all wrong. And uh, they really weren't going to transform the area uh, as they really should and to capture really the the heart of what that community needed. And having grown up there, I was very, very passionate about it. So I ended up going to planning school. And I spent the last six years working um, for the Patrick administration in housing and economic development, learning how to help communities put forward ec good economic development projects that they wanted to see advance, and understanding the underlying challenges to making that happen. So I ran the MassWorks Infrastructure Program, I was the State Permitting Ombudsman, um, and I really saw firsthand the, the power of what communities can do when they come together uh, to transform an area uh, and empower uh, transformation. So that's my, a little bit about my background and why I'm so interested in what the work LOCUS does and what we're doing here today, and I look forward to working with you over the next several months. It's always bad when you're respecting just 
speak? Oh, I thought it was skinny. Jeez. Uh, good, uh, good morning, uh, or good afternoon. I'm Christopher Coase. I uh, bring greetings from Washington, D.C. I'm um, actually a small town country boy from South Georgia, a small town called Thomasville. Uh, when I started as a military brat, I lived in Germany for a number of years, and I saw firsthand how communities uh, were quite different from my own rural experience. Um, going back home in Thomasville, you can see that uh, communities were literally divided by railroad tracks, and how community investment was predicated on the fact that a few people in a room were making decisions that had greater impact on a greater community. And I pledged at that time, at the age of 12, that I would use my experience, uh, both as a military brat, but in the love or, of politics, uh, to change that. Um, and since then, um, my focus has been how to create a bridge between those stakeholders who are in the room and the community outside to create an opportunity for communities like Thomasville can prosper uh, in a globalized economy. Um, one of the things uh, my tenure here at Locus uh, has been building a coalition of real estate developers who get it, who are believers in the triple bottom line, not just the profit, but the idea that we can do something and build something that actually impacts the planet in a positive manner, but also, and most importantly, leaves a positive impact on the community that it serves. Um, and that's what we are. Granted, we're very few <laughs> across the country, but the thing is, we've noticed for the past five years since I've been here, is a growing movement of figuring out how we can create a sustainable way of building um, our walk for urban places. Um, one of the things I'll just last and put on this end point, I'm very passionate about this conversation. I'm really excited that we've received the invitation from Somerville to be here, uh, working with Victoria and Chris. Uh, but one of the things I just want to leave here is that we are very committed to listen to you because this is your process and we're here to facilitate that uh, to make your process a reality. Um, at the end of the day, we want to see a situation here at Somerville that can be a model nationwide because I believe that as, as the market continues to go towards walk or urbanism, we're going to see major price points um, that can actually dissuade uh, 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 low-income residents to stay in those communities. We need to stop that. We need to figure out ways, sustainable approaches, to ensure that all of our communities can maintain its level of inclusivity, inclusivity as well as accessibility. So with that, I just thank you for allowing us to be here. I'm here to support, and I'll turn it back over to Chris and Victoria. So we're funded by the Barr Foundation. And if you don't know the Barr Foundation, it's the largest foundation here in the region. And they're committed to focusing on climate change and on sustainable transportation and walkable urban uh, development. So they've, they've asked us to come up here and uh, do two things, and you're going to see a, a, a piece of, of the first thing we did, because it, it'll be helpful to you to put Somerville and Union Square in context as far as looking at the walkable urbanness of metropolitan Boston. And but number two is then to implement it on the ground and to create both economic outcomes that are positive that drive social outcomes that are inclusive. Um, so it's really important to know that at one level, we don't care what the strategy is that you guys come up with. This is your strategy, and it's based upon the work that you've done. So I don't mean to sound crass, but you know, I don't live here. You do. This is your plan. What we do care about is that the strategy can be implemented in a fiscally prudent fashion. I, you can make it happen. If you don't, again, if you don't have an implementation plan, and, 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 and we're also asking you as the strategy leaders over the next three months, you're going to be asked to do things to help implement it. This is not just to give your opinion but we need you to help implement different aspects of the strategy that you pick. So this is not just, uh, you know, wouldn't this be nice? You might be called upon to actually start doing it. Um, but also keep in mind there's a lot of stakeholders here, and we're now going to hear from you and what, and the groups that you represent and the issues that you represent. That's what I want you to now go around and and there's going to be trade-offs, trade-offs by definition, and it all, you know, ultimately it comes down to what can you afford. And so those trade-offs you're going to have to be talking through amongst yourself. And one of the hopeful things that will happen here 
is that you'll begin to gain trust in one another. And so that somebody who's passionate about affordable housing versus somebody who's passionate about parks, that you understand that both represent groups that really care about those things deeply. And you have to find a way to figure out how to address both of those needs. Um, so we want you to, yes, public service announcements before we go around the room. Very quickly, we've added um, a couple of new folks to the room, so I wanted to um, just do some housekeeping. Uh, the first is that there is Wi-Fi available in this room, so if anybody doesn't want to spend eight hours draining your battery, um, you can find it. The username is cos-guest, and the password is guest one exclamation mark, all lowercase. So that's the first thing. The second thing is G-U-E-S-T-O-N-E exclamation mark. Uh, the second thing is this is being broadcast on Somerville Cable, uh, live cast right now. Uh, so if you want to get the word out, if there are people that you know that would like to tune in at any point during the day, um, that is available. And that is the reason why we're speaking with this funny microphone and why um, we're going to ask that anybody who wants to come up and speak and wants to make a comment, strategy leaders or part of um, me, any attendees, we will be putting this back um, on the podium and we will ask people to come up and speak so that your comments are captured. It's important for anybody who wants to tune in from home that they are also able to hear what's going on in the room. Uh, and the last thing is there are translation services available, made available through the city um, in Spanish, Haitian Creole, and Portuguese. So if you are in need of those services, please speak up, come find, there's staff members at, city staff members at the back of the room, come find me, we'll make sure we get that set up. We don't want anybody to miss, miss out on what the conversation is today um, as a result of not getting put in touch with translation services. Yes, I'm told that they're wired in. They may not broadcast to the room as well, but they're Looks like wired you, into yeah. the um, camera that you have. You, you should. should. Yep, I think you have to push the button. Um, so when you have a comment, please speak to the microphone. So, um, why don't we start going around the room to introduce yourself to one another. You probably, most of you know one another, but some of you won't. What I'd like you to do is obviously name and whether you live in Union Square, whether you work in Union Square, what's your connection to Union Square? And also to, to lay out the stakeholders, and, 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 and Victoria's going to be taking this down because we want to make sure that it's comprehensive, of the stakeholder groups that, that, that you're representing and the issues that you represent. One of the things that we're going to ask you to do, and I'll be explaining this in just a second, in between today and January 13th and 14th, when we next get back together, is to go back to those stakeholder groups and those issue groups to figure out what you would recommend to be the strategy for Union Square. Um, and, um, and then finally, think through what makes Union Square Union Square. What's the there, there, in your mind? So, Scott, why don't we start with you, and we'll walk, and then we'll go around. Good afternoon. My name is Scott Heyman, and I'm the real estate director for the Somerville Community Corporation, which is a community development corporation, which I know you're familiar with, Chris. And, um, We've been in existence for about 45 years uh, and have a long history of, on a number of fronts. Uh, one of the primary fronts, obviously, is the development and ownership and operation of affordable housing, both for low-income folks, for extremely low-income, for homeless, for folks with disabilities, folks who need support services, right on up to uh, working families, multifamily housing as well. And then very recently, also, very concerned about trying to uh, help the middle income in Somerville. We're losing out, we think, we're concerned that, you know, we could just carve out the whole middle and have extremely low income and then very high income folks. 
in Somerville only. So it's a great concern. Our office is in uh, Union Square above Sally O'Brien's, a great place, which I do frequent now and then. I shouldn't say that, but I do. And uh, we um, actually are experiencing the sale of that property. So we ourselves are feeling a little bit uh, uh, at risk in terms of all the change that's happening in, in Somerville and particularly Union Square. Uh, we also own and operate on Linden Street, right next to the proposed new uh, T-Stop, 42 units of housing, and we're in the process of developing and building a 35-unit, 100% affordable apartment building right off Union Square and Washington Street, next to a 100% market condominium project. And uh, so we're very active, obviously, in Union Square. Um, best in real estate side. On the other areas which are equally important, we have worked hard over the years to try to link folks to jobs and to better careers, get them into the job market and so forth, who otherwise may not be able to. So we have a number of asset building programs. We also have built a lot of home ownership condos uh, that we've sold out in the, in the marketplace here in Somerville that are long-term use restricted. So when they turn over another income eligible uh, family has to purchase the building at a discount rate, which is good. We provide home buyer training to huge amounts of folks from all over the region. Sadly, most people who go through those training classes do not end up being successful purchasing in Somerville. They're usually purchasing in less expensive areas in the metro area because of the high cost and the difficulty of obtaining and making purchases in Somerville right now. Um, money is flowing into Somerville from all over, really, the international marketplace. It's a very hot place. So therefore, to compete, if you're a home buyer, in Somerville means you have to almost be, you know, have cash in hand and uh, to have already, basically, to make a decision about purchase of a house, perhaps, in, in as little as a day or two hours to compete with cash buyers and so forth. Uh, we also are uh, basically very much involved on our organizing and community planning front with trying to help folks who often don't have a voice at the table or decision making uh, table um, to get involved in community discussions just like this. And so therefore are also a member of a wider, broader coalition called Union United and I'll let, there are some folks here who've been appointed as Union United members talk about their efforts and I'm sure you've been filled in a little bit on their efforts and um, so, you know, basically, we're here, we want to do the right thing, we think we've been a good long-term community member in trying to represent the needs of a whole variety of people. We recognize the trade-offs, as you say, between things like open space. We strongly agree with many that we need to build uh, an employment base here in Somerville. There's definite mismatch and so forth. And that should be discussed, I think, thoroughly and dealt with. And um, so we're here for the long haul. We want to be productive and cooperative. And uh, as you say, very committed as well to um, sustainable progress. And so last thing I'll say is almost all of our developments are LEED certified. Uh, the one in Union Square will be one of only about 25 buildings in the nation that will be uh, Energy Star Mid-Rise certified. So, mm -hmm. fantastic new systems there. So, thanks. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Bill Gage. Um, I'm representing the Somerville Redevelopment Authority. Um, I live on Columbus Ave, right above Union Square. And I've lived there since 1980. Um, so I have a very vested interest in the neighborhood and in Union Square. Um, prior to uh, being on the Redevelopment Authority, I basically worked for the Executive Office and Environmental Affairs in the MEPA office. So I'm very familiar with developers and development, and I used to be one of the reviewers in that office. Um, so I'm looking forward to what happens here, and of course I'm representing the Redevelopment Authority, which is the, the entity that's going to be responsible for the redevelopment of Union Square. Um, so I'm just looking forward to getting the process going. What is Union Square? What makes Union Square Union Square? 
Um, Union Square is great because it's a combination of uh, retail and, and neighborhood. And I think the mix of that and the, uh, between the retail, the restaurants, really makes it a neighborhood. Um, and uh, I really love living there. Good afternoon, my name is Irma Flores. Uh, as an immigrant, um, I came uh, to this country 15 years ago, and I'm pretty familiar what is the expectation of the Latino community or immigrant community in, uh, in this country, in this city. Uh, I used to work as a community organizer. Uh, I'm pretty familiar with uh, the community organizing uh, process. And I worked for the school department for two years, working as a, a parent liaison for the Somerville uh, school department. And uh, that, um, I would say, I gained some experience uh, and knowledge about what is the Latino or the immigrant community's needs. That's why I think, uh, um, I, I don't know if that is correct, <laughs> But uh, I will say that's why I'm here, because um, I know, based on my own experience as an immigrant and working with different families, what are the needs. And uh, for us, um, housing is a big issue. Uh, a school department, education, because most of the family, uh, they are found here in Somerville, a quality education and good services. And they are afraid if they have to leave, they have to find another school for the children. So that's, um, I would say, the main things. And it's most businesses too, because Somerville, uh, I think it has been given the opportunity for immigrants to create their own businesses. So we want to keep that in our community. Uh, right now I'm working as a community uh, specialist for the city of Somerville, but uh, I will say um, I, I know what the uh, Latino or immigrant communities needs. Uh, thank you. I didn't say why, uh, sorry, uh, Union Square. I think the diversity, that is great, how we can combine different cultures and we can allow the people to be integrated, especially the immigrant community. Thank you. Hi, my name is Seth Grady, and I'm here representing Union Square Partners. We are the, the new owners of the former post office building in Union Square. And uh, we bought it uh, a year ago, um, just about a year ago, at a time when the summer by design process was just starting. And our, our thinking on buying it was that we, we really believed in the future of Union Square and saw it as a, an opportunity, an economic opportunity. But at the same token, we felt it was kind of a unique combination of, uh, of things happening, where the extension of the Green Line uh, meant that accessibility to Union Square would improve, there would be a lot of change, but we thought that at the same time what was really unique, because lots of places have experienced rapid change and not always has it been positive for everyone, we felt what was unique about this case was that Somerville and Union Square were starting from a really a very strong position, very unique, uh, diverse community in Union Square, and also it was being planned very well. What the city was doing, what the community groups were doing, I think what this process is that we're sitting in today, but really what's gone on for the last year, gave us gave as good a chance as any for the change that would eventually come with growth and, and transportation change to be positive. And so we felt uh, coming in, seeing this building as a, as a good opportunity for us to be a part of that. Now, as we've uh, gone through the past year, we've uh, monitored and followed the community planning process. We've also studied very carefully the opportunities that our building presents in terms of redevelopment. And soon we will be starting to present them publicly. We, in fact, I think have a first public meeting scheduled for December 1st. Um, we believe that what we eventually will try to do with that building will do something that fits with the long-term vision of what 
Union Square should, could be, but that starts with fitting with what Union Square is now. So kind of the, the approach that we've taken is what can we do with the building that becomes a, a center of life that's accessible to the diverse community that is in and around Union Square so that it can serve and be useful to residents of Union Square today and then also evolve as Union Square evolves. Um, in terms of uh, how do I see what makes Union Square Union Square. I'm not from Somerville, um, although I did uh, grow up in Boston. I'm from Mission Hill originally. I live in, in Roslindale now. And over time, I've seen a lot of change, you know, some not so good, uh, and how communities have responded to it. Um, I think uh, what I would say is probably the, the strongest asset that Union Square is, is the same thing that Irma just said, which is its diversity. And its diversity not just in population, but diversity in, um, in activity. And so I think what we want to try to do is with, with our small part of Union Square and what we're redeveloping is be a part of a very diverse community that, that uh, hopefully is, uh, is useful and beneficial to almost everyone. projects, transmission, smart grids, and um, like others have said, I think uh, the, the climate uh, aspect of, of a lot of what we're talking about doing in Union Square is, is, is important. Um, I guess uh, what makes Union Square, Union Square, you know, I think it's diversity, but I, I, the, the small businesses are terrific. The, the number of restaurants, and there's a number of new restaurants that have opened just since I've been here, and I think Union Square, it's a, it's a, it is a destination. It's a place where there's a lot of activity going on and people can come and spend a significant amount of time there as opposed to passing through it on their way to somewhere else. So that's something I certainly want to preserve. And I think preserving um, you know, all, all levels of, of, of economic diversity is important as well. I think who mentioned, you know, it's, there's a lot of talk about maybe the top and the bottom, but a really strong middle class, I think, is what supports Union Square as well as much of Somerville, and that's, that's really important. Hi, uh, Pat McCormick, and I'm also a member of the CAC. Um, moved to Union Square about 22 years ago. Been a renter in uh, Murray, uh, well, for a long time now, a homeowner. Um, I think um, if there were four issues that are, are of particular interest to me, one is transportation and favoring pedestrians and bicycles over cars. I think for the first time in the history of cars, we've seen a decline in car ownership, but I, I don't think we're being aggressive enough in planning for fewer cars. Um, so that's a big topic. Um, and, and obviously it's connected to climate change, social well-being in cities. Um, secondly, um, I'm probably most interested in the most marginalized members of our community, particularly the homeless who I've worked with, um, and I think um, addressing that in a more structural way as part of this process is important. Thirdly, uh, design integrity. It's not enough to talk about how tall the buildings are, the percent of open space. It has to be about uh, design. And fourthly, um, planning. You know, We talked about what are we going to do the next three to four years, but 
we have to plan for three, four, five decades. I think we need to think about smart city technology, and some folks saw a presentation I did about that. Understand that it's not just about technology, it's about social well-being, and that these technologies will come uh, one way or another. And if we address it as a community, we can address terms of engagement around public data, open data, in cooperating across community, uh, private, and public sector organizations. Uh, also to benefit things like social well-being and uh, environmental sustainability uh, uh, and future-proofing our community to preserve what we want, but to plan for the future. Hi, my name is Ben Echevarria. Wow, that's really loud. Um, I'm a pastor in the community. I am also the acting director of the Welcome Project, which role is to build the collective power of immigrants to help shape um, things that are going on in the community. Um, I'm born and raised in Somerville. I'm a renter um, from a young age. I started off as one of the first Latinos in the city. Um, growing up, I've been heavily involved from my parents having the first Spanish church in the city to some of the other um, activities gone on to be, you know, work in with LULAC, um, actually as an intern and other things like that. Uh, now I'm just here really focusing on the overall immigrant, not just Latinos, but the, the broader immigrant population in the city. Um, my areas of concern are obviously, um, well, generally it's equality, is ensuring that, it's, that, that it, things are fair for everyone, um, not just a very specific group of people. Um, you know, one of the things that actually promoted me to want to be a leader was something you had said. Uh, which was um, at the Argenziano School where you said, you know, winners, the winners in this are homeowners and the losers are renters. And that really, you know, struck me and it made me want to be part of this process just for that reason. Um, you know, there are things like afford um, housing affordability, insuring small businesses, especially minority owned businesses, um, jobs, local jobs are very important to us and not just um, you know, minimum wage jobs, but good paying jobs for everyone is very important to me as well. Um, what makes Union Square Union Square? At the end for me, it's really the diversity. It's the second largest diverse area in the city. And, um, you know, I say this all the time and, I, and it's, it's an interesting thing. You can stand on a corner and if you're throwing a party, you can pretty much pick up everything you need. You know, you can pick up sushi, you can pick up, which by the way is owned by a Latino man, the sushi store. You can pick up a pizza owned by a local Indian um, man. You can pick up Indian food, you can pick up, you know, Chinese food, and just it goes on and on and on. So for me, that's what it's about, is really it's a small community of, of owners who all care and that's what I want to preserve, really. Hi, yes, uh, Wig Zamor, 13 Highland Avenue, member of the CAC. Um, I've been at 13 in an attic studio as a renter for 30 years, and um, before that lived on Walnut Street. Um, my employment has been largely in project development and financial strategy, uh, including real estate construction and development from very small scale to quite large scale. Also, startup company, seaweed company, um, started from scratch, sustainable harvesting, processing and product uh, development, life sciences, software developed for National Institute of Health, most, most of the pharma and biotech companies in the world. Um, but the last 15 years, I've spent most of my time on volunteer grassroots efforts, largely working through um, grassroots groups that have no paid staff at all. I uh, was a founder of Mystic View Task Force, which focused on Assembly Square, and also a founder of STEP, which has focused on delivering cleaner, more sustainable transportation to Somerville and across the region. Uh, spent yesterday afternoon and early evening as one of only two Somerville testifiers at the annual SIP Transit Commitment Hearings. Uh, trying to defend the green line and keep it, keep it on track. That was, I think, the 400th transportation meeting I've been, into, been to in the region in the last 15 years. Have you actually challenged them? Have we challenged them? No, have you challenged 
Well, it's pretty easy because I've been to over 200 MPO meetings alone, so the others don't have to be quite so large in number. But yeah, it's pretty easy to calculate. Um, the the things that I that I think are most important are getting Somerville to a reasonable balance, uh, doing it quickly, but being aware of the dangers of doing it quickly. So. Uh, you know, people have heard me before, but uh, along with our density and uh, our, our, our number one position with regard to multifamily housing per square mile in the state by far, nobody's close to that. Um, obviously, we have a large rental population and a, and a correspondingly large transition uh, every year of, of people who live in the city, uh, just, just like uh, Cambridge and Brookline do, but, but median income unlike those two communities. The things that we're most um, unbalanced in are jobs and, and open space. So we have by far the worst jobs to um, resident balance in the state, 351 out of 351. Took us a long time to get here, and it's going to take us some time uh, to improve. And part of that is because we did not adapt to the collapse of the manufacturing economy, which drove all of Eastern Mass until after World War II. And we live next to Boston and Cambridge, which have uh, twice as many jobs as they need and have the lion's share of the excess jobs and tax base in Eastern Massachusetts. And so, you know, for Somerville residents looking for work, there are 40 times as many opportunities in Boston and Cambridge. And we have no choice but to to seek those until we can develop a more balanced local economy. Um, in open space, we have about two acres per thousand residents of public open space. It, it's extraordinarily small, and it makes it impossible to have a healthy community, especially for people below median income. It's just not healthy. With regard to transportation, uh, one of the reasons we found it step was because Somerville is the most overrun by highway miles and the most overrun by diesel commuter rail miles per square mile per day, per year. You, you name the metric, but we have by far the most um, high emitting regional transportation. Less than 5% of the people on those highways and diesel rail live or work in Somerville. It's basically the sacrifice of Somerville health for the benefit of the regional economy that's centered in Boston and Cambridge. And, and that's why community path, walkability, um, light, light rail transit, why all those things are so important. The health costs are extraordinary for people who live next to highways. Just extraordinary. Especially compared with regional uh, pollution issues, which um, EPA tends to focus on uh, since the 60s and 70s. Um, with regard to Union Square, I, I think I would agree. I think it's inarguable. The diversity is an outstanding characteristic. Um, at the same time, I, I think the other hallmark of Union Square is, is closed or severely underutilized service businesses, including restaurants, virtually every weekday. Um, those are service industries. They have no daytime population to serve. So getting, getting to a balance, um, in all of these things at the same time as we pay attention to um, making sure that we don't end up with large scale that doesn't destroy small scale, and making sure that we don't end up with new things that uh, don't pay attention to old things. Thanks. Thank you. Frank? Hi. <coughs> My name is uh, Frank Valdez. I am a Union Square resident. I live on Walnut Street. I'm also a, an architect and urban designer. Um, I also am a member of the Design Review Committee for the City of Somerville. Um, currently, I'm lucky enough to have a varied group of projects that are working in the City of Somerville, ranging from market rate apartments to affordable housing and to senior housing as well. Um, so I've been working on the city fabric for uh, many years uh, since I've been here. Um, I'm also working in the adaptive reuse and restoration of a historic building for Mystic Waterworks building on uh, Route 16, which is owned by the Somerville Housing Authority, and we're converting it to affordable senior housing um, 
So for the past couple of years, I've been very ingrained really in the component of housing in a varied range of that in the city. So I've um, been lucky enough to understand it and see what the dynamic of it is. Um, I see Union Square as um, a uniquely organic neighborhood downtown because it is what it is. Um, you know, um, people gather there, people come there. Um, there's activity that e organically evolves as well, and I think that that, and with what everybody's saying about the diversity, is what makes it a unique uh, center for the city. Is this on? Yep. Okay, it's been on the entire time then. Said anything. Uh, my name is Eric New. I live over by Boynton Yards by the Royal Hospitality Building. My wife and I are relative newcomers. We moved here in 2011. Uh, we moved from New York City where we were basically priced out of New York City. So we've gone through uh, that experience of seeing so much massive development completely change a neighborhood. Um, and so we very much understand many of the things that all of us in this room are trying to prevent from happening. Um, the irony isn't lost on me, though, that when we moved and we're privileged enough to have jobs that we can more or less take with us uh, up here, that we went from lower on the relative local income scale to higher. So that's why we feel the responsibility to be engaged in this type of work and in the community. Uh, I'm a member of the CAC, I'm also uh, Union, uh, Union Square Neighbors. I'm involved with Union Square Main Streets, which I have to be because my wife is on the, the board of directors. Uh, <laughs> I think the reason why I was originally appointed up to the CAC is that I had just gone through um, the mayor's adaptive leadership program. It's something that he went through a uh, program uh, led by a Harvard professor at the JFA school, JFK school, and first the senior staff of City Hall, then more junior staff, and then finally they opened it up to uh, 30 um, residents and local business people. And it really is a program that's focused on um, how to negotiate workable solutions among multiple stakeholders that all have different points of view. So uh, that they actually just finished the second round of that. Uh, recently, I went through the first round prior to the CSE being launched. Uh, if I have a personal um, pet issue here, it's that uh, we have a two-year-old. We know a great number of young families that have children under four. The old model would be that you would rent in Somerville or maybe buy your first apartment or condo in Somerville, and then your first child would be entering the school age, or maybe you have a second and you need more room, and that's when you leave Somerville. And now we know a great many people, most of the people that we know that fall into that category don't want to leave, and they want to stay, and they're, they're having difficulty. Um, and this is middle income level families, um, because the housing stock just doesn't get built for that. That's my personal issue. My name is Benny, not Barry. Uh, it's spelled B-E-N-N-Y, so I fixed my name tag there. I'm gonna put this, I have this computer monitor, so I can only see like a third of the room. I'm gonna go ahead and move that. Okay, thanks. Um, so my name is Benny Wheat. I live in Somerville, right down the street from here. I, um, I rent, and I grew up in Boston, uh, and moved to Somerville about six and a half years ago. Uh, I'm a member of Union United. I am right now the chair of the steering committee for Union United, and within our own structure, I represent in particular renters um, in the Union Square area. Um, but I am also here kind of representing all of Union United, which is a broad-based community coalition made up of um, renters and owners, you know, residents of Somerville, also business owners, and faith communities and immigrant communities uh, and organized labor. So um, in terms of what, what issue I'm representing, I would say that I'm representing a lot of issues. I mean, I'm representing issues surrounding um, fair and equitable access to affordable housing, um, jobs, access to those jobs, um, green space, um, sort of issues surrounding the process and accountability to that process and enforcement, um, and a number of other issues. So I don't, I don't feel particularly aligned with one 
one topic over another. Um, and in terms of what makes Union Square Union Square, uh, for me personally, I think um, it's sort of the small places, uh, like the tailor shop and the, there's a number of uh, immigrant owned grocers and sort of the, the little spots that I think for a lot of people you walk by and don't notice that they're there. There's like a certain blind spot. You're like, oh cool, Machu Picchu. But then you don't notice like all the little, the little businesses that really are um, dependent on a place like Union Square that has a diverse um, clientele that comes through and dependent on the population of Somerville with its diversity. Where, you know, if all of the low income immigrant folks who live around here get priced out, those businesses not only will be priced out because they're gonna, you know, lose their lease on their on their store, but their the people that they serve are gonna move out. Um, and I think that it is a sort of a, a profound impoverishment that comes as that gentrification happens. So anyway, what makes Union Square Union Square is what happens before that profound impoverishment sets in, which is that diversity in those small businesses. Thank you. Great. My name is Don Warner. I have a background in in architecture, urban planning, and real estate development. Uh, I uh, became familiar with Somerville back in 1989 when I purchased the old Union Square police station from the city. Um, I converted that building into a commercial office building with retail and restaurants. Uh, my tenants at the beginning and until now have all been a combination of nonprofit, social service agencies, startups, um, small service providers. Um, so it's been a good mix um, of, of Union Square, of the city of Somerville. Uh, I, um, I became, uh, I, I've also, I was a former, I am a former member of Union Square Main Streets. Um, I, um, I, I represent the property owners and other entrepreneurs, I like to think I represent them. Um, I see Union Square, uh, uh, I, I think one of the most important things about Union Square, which hasn't been mentioned yet, is, is its history. I mean, it goes back to pre-Revolutionary War. It played a very important role in this country's history. Uh, at the same time, it's always been in transition. It's always been very dynamic. Uh, I think, I'm not sure of this precisely, but I have one of the first um, transit systems, trolley systems running from Union Square, I think, to Harvard Square. Um, ironically, that was wiped out and then became very automobile dependent. And now it's going the other way, and hopefully we'll have more public transportation through the uh, extension of the green line. <coughs> I, I think what what I would like to see happen is more of the same. I think we should build on our history, uh, certainly on a diversification that, that, that exists. I think we should, cons we should always be in transition. Uh, we should always be a dynamic um, city. And um, I guess what I see um, I guess whatever I can do to, to make that happen, I would uh, be interested in pursuing. Hi, my name is Stephen Mackey. I'm the uh, full-time staff for the Somerville Chamber of Commerce. Um, uh, it's a local business association, and we have uh, businesses, property owners, nonprofits, sole proprietors, uh, basically representing um, all of the industries uh, and fields uh, in Somerville, uh, Somerville's economy. Uh, about 20 years ago, um, feeling what was happening with the urban resurgence that was going on around here and also around other parts of the world, um, the Chamber of Commerce uh, formed a special committee called the New Group, uh, and it was basically to take to lead a discussion and um, some direction for the chamber relative to the urban resurgence that was 
already uh, affecting the city and uh, promised to continue to do so as it has. Um, in, in that discussion that the group started, um, what one of the questions asked was, what, what do we all have in common? You know, people live, work, and play in the city, what do we all have in common? Well, what, what we thought was uh, it's an urban quality of life that we hope, all hope to enjoy and share, uh, whether we just live or just work or just play here or do some combination of all three. Um, and okay, what, is, what does that mean? And well, we, we, the discussion got into a uh, great many things, but Chris crystallized into three things uh, as important to underscore every conversation. And that is that if you're talking an urban quality of life, you have to start with the cornerstones of public works, public safety, and public education. That if you don't have strong cornerstones in that regard, then talking about enhancements to the quality of life for everybody is really a non-starter. Around here in New England, public works, public safety, and public education all are uh, come out of this building. Uh, and they were all related to the local treasury and how much wherewithal the city has to deliver public works, public safety, and public education. And that speaks to how strong is the local uh, property tax base and uh, economy. Uh, that can help feed the treasury so that it's not just about residential check taxes. So you need a strong economy to help support public works, public safety, public education, the urban quality of life. And day to day, what that translates to, we talk a lot about and do a lot in dining and nightlife, uh, the chamber does, to help develop that whole cachet and capacity for some of them develop the dining and nightlife economy, but a city has to work daytime and nighttime. Uh, it has to work during the week and on the weekends. We do very well nights and weekends. We need to develop the work week economy. That means jobs in the daytime. Daytime jobs that will help support uh, street economy and street life. Um, so we're looking at developing the whole um, aspect of the city uh, the community of some of them. We feel like it's very, it has a very strong uh, frame to work in. And the frame we describe is it's the most densely populated city, it's closer to downtown Boston than most of the city of Boston, and it's in the brain power triangle of MIT, Harvard, and Tufts. That's a great place for all of us to stop and work together. And when we take a look at Union Square, we think of Union Square and have for the long for longest time that in New England it's, it's probably one of the most diverse places that you can find in all of New England and it's diverse not only in the residential population but possibly even more so in the business population. One of the most in terms of all the gatherings we go to in the course of chamber business one of the most uh, diverse gatherings in some of them is when you go to a licensing commission meeting. And there are, there are proprietors looking for entertainment licenses, and alcohol licenses, and so forth. And if you look around the room, it's a great variety. Uh, it's a great diversity of some of them. Um, so we believe in developing that economic strength of this community so that it can share the quality of life that it desires. So, and that is all a shared vision. So we believe that we, you know, we should be participating in bringing what we can in terms of an economic perspective to help uh, to help the discussion along that way. Union Square, in particular, um, it has tremendous historic bones. They go back to the 1630s. Um, Washington Street was, the, depending on whether you were where you were, it was the road to Charlestown or it was the road to uh, Cambridge or Newtown. Uh, it goes back to the 1630s. Um, so, and it was a place of commerce almost from the very beginning. Today, it's a fabulous location. It is one mile from Assembly Road. It is one mile from Harvard Square. It is one mile from 
MIT, MIT and Kendall Square. So, and, and we, we, we look forward to uh, people 10 years from now speaking about what an advantage is it, it is to be in Harvard Square because it's so close to Union Square. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Amanda Meyer and I'm with the city's economic development department. I've been with the city for three years now and I work on a number of projects here ranging from program managing the assembly square redevelopment, the union square redevelopment with some of my co-workers here as well. Um, I manage the city's brownfield redevelopment program, so I'm, I'm very in tune with a lot of the environmental conditions in Union Square specifically. I have more recently been looped in on some of the infrastructure improvements and some of those projects, including the MathWorks application and uh, the city's Tiger application. Um, and I also am I also manage the city's workforce development program. So it's a little bit of this and that. Um, my my background before I joined the city is my uh, background's in public policy as well, I was not the only one with that, um, but my focus was specifically on urban economic development as it relates to public policy. And when I first finished grad school, I went and I worked for a few years for an organization called the Initiative for a Competitive Inner City. Um, that is an organization based in Boston, but they are a national research and strategy organization that is very focused on identifying the private sector strategies for inner city economic development. And so, I had the opportunity to work on inner city economic development strategies, really focusing on how to lift up lower income residents um, in cities from Boston to Detroit, to LA, to Chicago, um, to Atlanta, Georgia. So, so it's been a great opportunity for me to learn what some of the best practices are in terms of urban economic development, specifically inner city economic development around the country. Um, here today, you know, I'm obviously a representative of the city and of our Office of Strategic Planning and Community Development. I am also a resident of Somerville. I live in the Winter Hill neighborhood. I've lived here for um, four years now, five years now, um, and I'm excited to be here in the city and to be a part of this process. You know, for me personally, I'm definitely, you know, to Eric's point, I you know, hear loud and clearly that a lot of people my age and a lot of my friends have, you know, as soon as they have their families, young families, they're no longer able to stay in Somerville. So, I mean, for me personally, I'm very interested in the, the idea of middle income housing and family housing and how we can make sure that people can stay because I truly believe that Somerville is one of the greatest places for families here in the community. Um, are here in Massachusetts. So I also wanted to just briefly acknowledge a few other people who are in the room today. On behalf of the city, we're excited to have so many other people here with us today. Um, I know we have Van Hardy here from, um, from he was Jobs for Somerville, and he's been very actively involved in a lot of our workforce development efforts um, through our partnership with SEC at the city, and is also a member of Union United. We have uh, Renee Mardones. Um, Renee is also a Union United and a member of SEC and has you know, have had the pleasure of working with him also on our workforce development efforts. Um, we have Tori Antonio, who has been a very vocal advocate for us in the community on issues of green space and architecture. And next to her we have Father Curran, who is a, also a CAC member and um, been very actively engaged in this process. And then in the back we have Tim Talon from Union Square Neighbors, and so we're, we're thrilled that he's able to join us here as well. So um, there's many familiar faces in the audience. We expect more to trickle in throughout the day. So again, we want to, from the city, absolutely thank so many of you who have been here and continue to be here. Um, even if you were not you know, able to participate as a strategy leader, we're so thankful and, and looking forward to your participation throughout the process. Hi. Um, my name is Esther Hennig. I'm the executive director of Union Square Main Streets, and Union, Mar Union Square Main Streets exists. We work collaboratively to preserve the character of the neighborhood and to advance the, the economic future of the square. Um, clearly, we're, we're very concerned about preserving the character of the neighborhood. We love the diversity. As someone said to me one time, they said, well, in Union Square, you can dine around the world, which I think really kind of you know, sums it up. I, I think the other things that are really um, characteristic of, of Union Square is the local. We have a lot of local businesses, a lot of immigrant and ethnic businesses, as has been mentioned. I think, um, I think one thing that hasn't been mentioned is like the sense of, I, I'm fairly new here. I've only been here nine months. And, I'm still in the honeymoon stage, and I'm, I'm quite enamored of Union Square, I have to say. 
And I really think it has a sense of really strong community, almost a sense of village, which I really value. Um, the other thing is, as you know, we're known for the Fluff Festival. And, and I think, you know, the Fluff Festival is a celebration of local and innovation and creation. And I think that's another thing about, about that is very historic about Union Square is the, is the, the, the creation and the innovation, innovative spirit of the square. Um, I'm here to represent local businesses, and in that vein, we held a meeting last week so I could get the input and share some of the input. Um, there were 24 businesses in, involved in kind of giving some feedback, so I want to share some of what they said. So first of all, um, two things that we've heard is affordability is huge, and we have a lot of these wonderful businesses who are very, very afraid they won't be able to remain. So affordability and, and, and the ability to remain in Union Square is a huge concern. And then an ongoing concern that you've heard a lot is traffic. We really need daytime traffic. So this, you know, the, the commercial development is also very important to maintaining and sustaining and building the vitality of the square. Um, another thing that came up was jobs, you know, getting, getting the staff that people need um, as well as the customers they need. And that they're seeing because of the rising housing prices, it's harder and harder to find staff who can, can get there at the hours that are needed and in the weather that's needed. So the transportation and affordable housing also relates to the vitality of the square and, and the future of the businesses. Um, other things that that came up were um, parking, which you know a lot of a lot of the businesses are concerned about parking, um, traffic patterns. People are just concerned that that people are having a hard time getting to Union Square. Um, people really like the idea of the incubator spaces and want that to continue. Sustainability was big. Strengthening the arts community was something that came up. Um, clearly retaining local owners and workers. Um, people are concerned, I don't know whether I just throw this, they're concerned about the construction and how the current and future construction is impacting their business now and in the future. Um, looking forward to upgrading public spaces. Um, and I think that's it. I mean, I think the, the, the really important thing is the diversity, the affordability, and, and daytime traffic, and even, even like the five to seven um, slot of like sort of the after work business is also a concern. Scott and I've been in Somerville for 16 years. I live right up the hill from Union Square and I co-own a small photography business in Union Square. Um, I'm here representing Green and Open Somerville which is a group of residents working to improve and increase green space and as well as open space but specifically green space I think it gets the short end of the stick because we don't define it separately from open space. Um, my biggest concerns outside of green space would be that we're going to cut corners um, in the name of expense and I think that we will lose, potentially lose aspects of our community that are really important and we'll regret later. So I really hope in this process we can maybe sacrifice certain things. Maybe we don't have as, I'm not saying I don't want tall buildings, I'm just going to, for example, maybe we sacrifice some height on a building if it saves money somewhere else and we can build a park or keep an open venue or um, keep a small business. So I really hope that we can focus on things that are important to us for years to come, not just the short term and, you know, when a developer can make all their money and then leave. I really hope that the community can keep a sense of itself. Um, what, I, what is important to me? Um, I, you know, this question comes up so much and I guess there's not one specific thing. It's certainly not, doesn't have the prettiest buildings or the best parks. Um, but I think it's special because people think it's special. And so it's like a, it becomes a, everyone's favorite place because we say it is special. And it's usable. It's sort of like the old couch that nobody minds jumping on. 
we can be there, we can use it. It's not something that's prescribed that we have to be careful with. I'm David Gibbs. I'm the executive director of the Community Action Agency of Somerville. We're the federally designated anti-poverty agency for the city. Um, and I'm also a member of Union United. CAS is one of the three nonprofits that sort of backbone Union United on the institutional side. And I'm also a Somerville resident. I moved here in 93, and my first house was on Prospect Street, just down the street from the radiator guy that is no more. Um, that was my introduction to Union Square. Um, so could, could we maybe cover that for a moment or two? Thank you. That would be, it's really distracting. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, CAS exists to help low-income individuals and families with direct advocacy, uh, helping them to uh, better their situation, uh, obtain benefits they're entitled to, get training they need, get help with problems they may be having, all in the name of raising them out of poverty. Um, we are also uh, mandated to do what we can to reduce and eliminate the systemic causes of poverty in our city. Um, and that latter piece is, uh, is really why I'm, you know, why I'm here today. I think this is a really complicated situation we've got. Uh, from the point of view of the low-income residents of the city, I will tell you that for many of them it's already too late. Uh, we have a homelessness prevention program that um, sees virtually every low-income person in the city that's gotten an eviction notice, and those numbers are flooding us. People are being evicted left, right, and center, and for the most part, when they're evicted, they have to leave the city. The numbers of low-income residents are dropping precipitously. So I don't think that that's due to anyone's malice. We've gotten ourselves into a situation here that kind of snuck up on us. Um, but the reality is that it's, it's happening and it's happening harder and faster than anybody could have planned for. Um, I think therefore that in order to address that, if we mean what we say about keeping the diversity that matters to us, we need to think way outside of the box, we need to think very aggressively, and we need to do some things that maybe we would initially say, oh, we can't do that, that that's not possible. We need to throw that phrase out the window and think about well, why isn't it? <laughs> Let's try it. Uh, because otherwise, we are not going to have a low-income population except for the relatively small number of folks who do live in public housing and will continue to live in public housing. Um, what Scott said about a, a city that's empty in the middle, a few wealthy residents, a few low-income residents will become our reality. Um, for me, what makes Union Square Union Square, uh, certainly the diversity that everybody has talked about, it's a place where Everybody feels welcome. Um, right outside of my office, which is in Don's old police building, thank you, Don. Um, <laughs> um, you know, there are usually uh, groups of elderly Sikh gentlemen sitting and chatting with each other. There are folks from the Ruby Rogers Center next door, many of whom are struggling with various forms of mental illness and other issues. Um, homeless people living in the square, people walking through on their way to various businesses. and. In, in, I've been there now for just over a year working there and I have yet to see any overt conflict in the square among any of these very, very different people. We, we live with each other. It is, a, it is a place where people coexist happily. Um, I'm going to digress into design for just a moment because I think there's something about the way Union Square looks and the diversity of its architecture right now. Yeah, some of the buildings are downright ugly. Some of them are really quirky, some of them are quite beautiful. But that's part of what makes it possible for people to feel comfortable there. It's not monolithic. It's not a series of, of facades that, you know, say we're, we're accessible to people who can get into this building and have the correct security clearance. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a place where people feel they can be welcomed. And that's, uh, I think, from a design perspective, is something we definitely don't want to lose. That's it. Good afternoon. My name is Glenn Ferdman, Director of Libraries here for the City of Somerville. I've been here for a little over six months, born and raised in Chicago. I've been a librarian for more than 20 years in just about every type of environment there is, including legal 
healthcare, business, school, public, and academic libraries. I also want to, um, oh, rather, uh, what attracted me to Somerville was its um, vitality, diversity, and, and opportunity. And I want to also acknowledge at this time the presence of Mr. Mark Howland, who is a board member and past president of the Somerville Public Library Board of Trustees. Thank him for his presence. The library stakeholders. In my opinion, our stakeholders include the Union Square residents of all ages and backgrounds. And the issues that we face and that we address in the, in the library include providing library services to meet the neighborhood needs, including free access to Wi-Fi and computers, English as a second language classes, computer classes, early childhood literacy programs, providing information about resources to new immigrants and job seekers, helping people upload a resume or how to uh, open an email account, a safe place for latchkey kids to hang out after school, meeting spaces, literary current events and performing arts programs that we provide, and of course, our bread and butter, collections of books, music, movies, and so forth, for loan, all free of charge. And then finally, places to read, study, and to collaborate. What makes Union Square unique, in my limited experience, is its vibrancy, its diversity, and its rich history of transportation, small business, and manufacturing. And that history, incidentally, for those of you who may be aware of this, includes a branch library on Bow Street for many, many years. And then finally, I wanted to make an additional point about uh, some of the uh, added values that library, libraries provide that some folks may not be aware of, and that is there are studies uh, that have demonstrated positive economic impact uh, on local businesses and also on housing values that are in close proximity to public libraries. So, thank you. Hi there. I'm Jennifer Lawrence, and I have made Somerville my home for the past 13 or so years. Um, previously, uh, as a renter, Previously, I was the director of Groundwork Somerville, and through that, we ran a process with uh, staff and with SEC to look at the Green Line Extension and, and look at what land uses we wanted and what protections we wanted for the residents and businesses here. So I have that um, knowledge behind me. I'm, I'm happy to chat about it. Um, for the past four years, I've been a city planner with Cambridge, so we're, we're the lucky folks that, that have that industry. Um, and for me, it's very, very important that we talk about creating that, those commercial opportunities, creating businesses, um, ensure that our local independent businesses can stay here and that the owners are not priced out of their homes or where they work and, and um, pay for those homes. Um, for me personally, it's very important. I'm a renter um, for the <laughs> very foreseeable future. Um, I don't want to leave Somerville. And I've been a civil servant my entire life, so um, I don't have much money. Um, and I, I don't want to have to leave. I want to be able to own a home here. Um, middle income housing is really important to me. I, um, I'm also the board president of Somerville Local First, and I'm not, um, not here as an official rep of that. But um, I'm a small business owner as well, and I would love to be able to keep my business here as well. <laughs> um, I am also by, by trade, I'm, a, I'm an urban environmental planner, so um, I really wanted to build upon this discussion of a walkable community. Um, I don't own a car, and so I primarily get around by walking and biking and taking the buses, and, and um, I know we're not, we're not talking about the Green Line extension here, but when we do see that extension come through, I want to make sure that people can still get around the community in all, with all of those modes. Um, I was, you know, a year and a half ago hit by a car in Union Square. It's a very, very dangerous place for people who are not in a car, in a vehicle. Uh, so I want us to, to look at that mobility around the square and figure out how to, to make it work. Um, and there's a community benefits agreement. There's many things we could do with that. Um, and then finally, I think the reason why I'm here and, and the city can tell us, Amanda can tell us later, but is because I'm an environmental planner. So I've led a number of community engagement processes around design and, 
and um, around our planning process work, project work, um, and climate change is, is really the base of what I do. So I'm a sustainability planner in Cambridge. I work on everything from sustainable transportation projects to energy efficiency projects to building energy use disclosures. So um, I would, I, I think that's probably what I can bring um, from a professional point of view. There's something else, oh, Union Square, what makes it unique to me? Um, and what makes Union Square Union Square? For me, it's that um, it is a meeting place. It's the space that I go to. I actually can't afford to live in Union Square, um, so I, I do live in Winter Hill as well. Um, and it is the space that I, you know, I walk through every day on my way to work, and I walk home through, and, and I see my friends and my neighbors, and and um, I stop at all of the businesses throughout, and um, that's really important. It, it is a meeting, a gathering space. I'm Joe Beckman. I live on Union Square. I'm old. <laughs> I'm, I took in, 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 in two days. I'll be 72. And what's interesting about Union Square to me is that all of the things I've done all my life come together. I did black rights, I did civil rights, I did, I did gay rights, I did women's rights, I did disability rights, I did um, uh, Latino rights. I've been with all those organizations over 40 or 50 years. And uh, by training, I was an historian. I taught, I used to teach American history, urban history particularly, the urban history of New York as it built subways so that I see all kinds of things coming together in my history, in my background, that are current and contemporary and dynamic. Uh, I used to work with economic historians and the economic impact of, the, of what we're talking about is not new at all. It has a wonderfully rich history, which frankly, if kids and others could play with, they would see all, all sorts of implications. Um, it, my goal now, I'm, I'm and the mayor has put me on too many committees. I'm on lots of committees. And the point of the committees is largely to find ways to harness gentrification. Because you can't stop it. But when I escaped Cambridge 20 years ago, uh, I had some friends who were political. And so we came in and talked, talked with my Capilano and discovered all the goodies that I could get. And then they changed most of those goodies because there were too many immigrants from Cambridge. And so we made deals. And they were good deals. I mean, I found that I could get my interest rate lower and things like that. And then he put me on the affordable housing task force that he had in 1998. And we invented the, we invented the, the, the Somerville version of the real estate transfer tax. And so part of my biggest attempt in that is to get that passed in a way which is viable, not just in Somerville, but that provides the laboratory function of Somerville to the rest of the country. Uh, I have many people who have expressed interest in Cambridge, and many in Boston, many in California. And part of the issue now is to frame it in such a way that it really can give them lessons. Our density is remarkable. My experience historically was as, was as, a, as a teacher, as an educator, and there are 57 languages in the high school. Of those 57 languages, about 20% of those kids are children of grad students. So you can't generalize about some of them. And that's a remarkable, remarkable opportunity. Because not generalizing about immigration is a really important thing. And not generalizing about diversity, just recognizing that it's natural and organic in this city is a tremendous lesson for the rest of the world. You look at Paris, and you see what we could have taught Paris, and what we still can. So that's my lesson for, for you to describe. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ileana Tasher. I'm a pretty new summer home resident. I moved here back in June. Um, so I'm actually really excited to start getting more involved here because I've come to really fall in love with this place and also in the honeymoon phase. Um, so I, I work for an organization called the Urban Land Institute and we're a nonprofit. We're a mission based nonprofit which is uh, to promote the responsible use of land. Uh, one of the programs that we have is called our Technical Assistance Program. Um, so I've been involved with that the past year. And what that is is that we go around and help different communities in uh, the New England area with issues around development and redevelopment. So I've also been on the non-stakeholder side, and this time I am a stakeholder uh, because I do really like this community. Um, I think something that I find, or one of the issues that is most important to me, although there are a number, um, 
is uh, middle income housing because uh, I do have a number of friends who are in the same age range as me, young professional, just out of school, and um, if I tell people where I've moved and that I'd like to stay here potentially long term, I kind of laugh and say good luck, and that's, um, that's not really a great thing to hear. Um, so I guess that's the demographic I'm speaking from. It's a four letter word, I'll say it's millennial probably. Um, but yeah, I'm glad to, I'm glad to be a part of this. Um, I think I've heard a lot today about the diversity of, of Union Square, which is definitely really important. Um, but something I haven't heard so much is the multi-generational diversity. Um, I think I moved from Austin to here. <laughs> Austin is, is a lot of college students, and that's a great thing when you are a college student. Um, but one of the things I really like so much is that I see young families, and I see young professionals, and I see um, people who are older, and it's, it's really a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Ann Tate. I apologize for being late. I'm um, an architect and community planner and a professor who has a class that in Rhode Island that runs until 12.40, so um, that's why I was late. And I'm a one-time, it was probably only a one-time public official. In all of that, my specialty is sustainable development. Um, I'm a resident of Somerville of 20 years this uh, winter. And um, uh, though I don't live in uh, Union Square, I live, as I guess some others do, in the distant reaches of Winter Hill. Um, and I am, uh, have been co-chair of the um, Citizens Advisory Committee. And I think that in terms of constituencies or, or who um, we represent, I think uh, it was said this the other day at the ABX conference yesterday that, that I think a lot of us see ourselves as the guardians of the long, uh, the long view and the, um, trying to get the framework right so the community can grow in the long term. Hi, my name is Jenny Sessione and I work as the Haitian Peer Liaison for the city. Um, I've been working with and serving both residents and small businesses not only in Union Square, but throughout the city. And uh, I feel confident that I can be a liaison between this process and the Haitian residents of the city. Um, I'm a newcomer to Somerville. I live um, on Summer Street, and I like the fact that I can have access to different cuisines in Union Square as a foodie. Um, and I hope that it's feasible for Union Square to keep its soul and at the same time flourish. Thank you. Hi, my name is Derek Seabury. I'm the President and Executive Director of the Artisans Asylum. Um, sorry, I'm a little under the weather and late getting in today. Um, but the Artisans Asylum is a community um, nonprofit uh, organization uh, focused on teaching, learning, and practice of fabrication. We make things. Um, we have about 400 active members, and every year a few thousand uh, lifelong learners come through. Uh, we're all adult education and helping people uh, create the world they want to live in. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and we're part of what is an incredibly vibrant community of artists in Somerville. And as such, the community that I represent there um, is concerned not just with you know public art opportunities and opportunities to uh, create and share their work, but uh, affordable places to live and affordable places to work. Um, the, uh, the community that we have are, you know, oftentimes currently working on all the various uh, warehouses that are now being, you know, kind of improved and whatever because it's their creative people that take advantage of the space that is available. Um, I'm not saying we keep dumpy warehouses and things to make studio spaces, uh, but these are people that have become part of a community that has uh, traditionally had a tremendous portion of artists in the population um, and a long history of that. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The other aspect, um, when people come to me, they're like worried, oh, what's the future of our place? And, you know, we're working on how we continue to exist. Um, we're right now, uh, I think, the largest tenant in the kind of innovation village in the Ames Business Park. We have 40,000 square feet of studio spaces and workshops. Um, and 
the bigger concern I have is people come to me and they say, if this goes away, where will I go? There's no place else I belong. And it's a bigger picture, and it's community. Um, society's changing a lot, especially with millennials. Uh, they may not have you know, a church community that speaks to them, or uh, some sort of other organizational community. And I can't be the only one that's harboring some of these miscreants. The, um, there are a lot of communities around, and mine happens to be you know, made of both you know, retirees looking to have a, a second act, uh, and kids that just got out of art school and found out they now don't have access to any of the tools they just spent $100,000 learning to use. Um, so it's really fun and rich, and we have events. If anybody wants to come on Saturday, we have Makesgiving, uh, where we celebrate with our family and have some food. Um, but uh, one of the things, you know, beyond trying to make sure that we continue to have it be affordable for small fabricators and people that are creating things to both live and work uh, in and around Somerville and Union Square specifically, uh, I have a particular care for communities. What are the communities that are here? Uh, certainly more than just the one I'm a part of. And how do we encourage that as uh, people get a little more disconnected these days electronically? Uh, so that's what brings it in, you know, specifically, again, we're right there. I like to think that the definition of Union Square was expanded to include us. You know, a former wasteland between Porter Square and Union Square, uh, all of a sudden a, a big old empty warehouse got filled with crazy artists and giant robots and then a brewery and a rock gym and this huge innovation, uh, uh, you know, center with Greentown. And uh, it's really exciting to see what we can do with some kind of planned strategic growth and it's you know, a very specific revitalization that I think is super exciting and I hope uh, is defensible and something we can do, not just protect, but do more of. You know, I think it's been a, it's a grand experiment. Uh, and yeah, so we're very excited to be you know, mentioned as a cool thing that's part of Union Square. Uh, you know, at the DPW's request, we did stop giving away hundreds of marshmallow shooters to children during the fall <laughs> festival. Uh, but, uh, but the ability to have units where there and have a public event and you know things like that, this, it's the most collect, collective set of things you'll find happening in a public space. And that's what's great. It's not, you know, I had um, an intern come in and said, well, you know, and I was saying it's an opportunity to be part of all the great things happening in Somerville. He says, oh, what are the great things happening in Somerville? Uh, well, you know, this is the city, when we have a parade, we march in it and ride our bicycles. You know, when we have a music festival, it's on our porches. You know, this is a, a do-it-yourself, you know, make a community you want to be in place. And obviously that speaks to me as a do-it-yourself making kind of supporter. Uh, and when we create, you know, 700 new units of housing that have no porches, you know, where are we going to put those bands? Because I want the same people in them, you know? How do we continue to have these traditions on a different scale and as we're more inclusive to more people? So that's what brings me. Correct. I wish that I were. I could claim to be with you. Okay. She's a great community contributor. But uh, I'm actually Stephanie Hirsch. Oops. I'm actually Stephanie Hirsch, and um, I live in the Lincoln Park neighborhood, which is um, between Union and Inman Squares. And um, with the neighbor, we've organized a lot in the last 10 years um, that particular neighborhood. I also have been really active at the Argenziano School, which is the the school that serves um, both Prospect Hill and um, the Lincoln Park area. That's the catchment area for, for students coming to that school. Um, I've also worn a lot of different hats in the city and the schools, um, many different uh, types of roles. Um, and so I would say the, area, the, the issue that's worried, been on my mind the most in the last few years is, um, is the ability of families to stay and, and thrive in Somerville. If you don't already know, uh, about 68% of our students in our schools qualify for free and reduced lunch, and that puts their family income at about 45,000 for a family of four. And if you crosswalk that to the AMI tables for affordable housing, that puts them at the 50% AMI. Um, and uh, you know, as we know, there's basically no units that could be rent rented or purchased that are legal and safe for families at that income level and those that do have a deed restricted uh, or in the Somerville Housing Authority are, are full and with, with no movement. So I think families, and, and just to say about families too, that they have additional costs. Lots of times they have childcare costs. 
and um, they also have additional requirements. They might need at least two bedrooms. So I think this is a really special um, group to worry about as Somerville goes forward. Um, there are many more poor families than the general population, and I think that we will see just a real sea change in who, who, who are in our schools. And um, yeah, so it's just something to think about. I'm not sure what to do, but um, it's, it, and it's truly, it's, and Regina will talk about this later, but it is truly heartbreaking to watch children who have been in the school, the school system since pre-kindergarten and are just six, thriving. You think about these immigrant kids, like they're not only going to succeed, they're going to support their, child, their, their parents, their younger siblings, and people back in the country that they came from. So it's just extraordinary, to, you know, investment that we've made and success that they're experiencing, and it's really sad to lose them. Um, the other issue that I worry about in Somerville is kind of the strength of community organizations in general. I think we do so well at the really interesting and innovative um, events and organizations like some of you have mentioned, and those are so fun, but I feel like we're sort of missing some of the kind of old-fashioned community organizations like really strong youth-serving organizations, um, really strong churches, um, and I think that those are some really great uh, places because they, if they're uh, free enough or affordable to many people, um, they can really help people who are the most low income and the middle class, as well as upper, you know, and the, the more, a little bit higher income, mix together and kind of meet some basic needs of having uh, programming and a place to go. Um, and, uh, and just one more thing that uh, when I think about the different kind of ways that we talk about public spaces, I always think uh, about it from the perspective of a child, either kids I work with in the schools or my own kids who are um, four, seven, and nine. And they have such a different way of looking at a public space. Um, I was sitting in the Union Square Plaza and my kids were walking around and around on the little um, ledge on the, one of the, veteran, the Veterans Memorial that's there. And I think that when we think about the public spaces, I hope that we'll find really active uses for them and not just passive use, uh, places to drink your coffee, the places that are really authentic and really um, serve all the different piece, parts of our community. And I do understand that Union Square is going to be an economic engine for Somerville and that it will earn revenue, commercial and residential tax base revenue that will pay for building up the capacity of recreation programs or the schools. Um, but I kind of want to understand what exactly is the mechanism to make sure that um, you know, to basically to balance that with the need for, the hope that it could also be an authentic neighborhood that does have civic space, that does have active uses, that where we do see children walking through it of all different types. So I'm delighted to be part of the process and look forward to the conversation. Thank you all. Um, this is a weird place, pretty obvious. Um, and also a highly educated place, so there's going to be a lot of opinions, and so again, the trust that needs to be built up, the you know the trade-offs that you're going to have to go through over the next couple of months are important to keep in mind. That a lot of people have passionately held beliefs, and so do you, and you're going to have to figure out how to bridge those gaps. So, David, Renee, if you don't mind, um, that. I want to walk through very fast because we've spent um, appropriately a lot of time understanding the various perspectives that are around this, these tables. This is the process that we're thinking about, that, we, uh, that we're working under. Prior to today, we've been working on the briefing book, which we're going to be going through in just one second to make sure everybody's up to speed on all the knowledge that you've created over the last three years, four years. Um, and of course, we want to hear from the audience in just one second, make sure we haven't missed anything. Today, it's to review that briefing book. It's really hard to see the screen. Is it possible to turn out some of these other lights? So that the Somebody's going to off to do that right now. Good idea. It's the floodlights. <laughs> Anybody have a BB gun? Those are for the cameras. We have a technical challenge. Perhaps, could you move up? Is it possible? The, today is informational. 
to take in and make sure everybody has the same level of knowledge. This is a Jeffersonian concept. This is the, this is the educated populace of, of our country. Everybody should have access to the same information. Nobody is an expert. We're all amateurs trying to learn a, 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 about a lot of different subject matters. Um, you're going to be reviewing the neighborhood plan that was made public a couple weeks ago, and we'll be reviewing the fiscal impact uh, study, which is really crucial, which is, again, as I mentioned earlier, this proves that you're at the big person table um, with Thanksgiving coming up, because you're going to be making decisions based upon the fiscal impact on your city to be able to pay for the community benefits that we've been uh, discussing already. And then we're going to give out to you a set of strategy cards that are what I refer to as a universe of options, some of which you're going to throw out instantly, but we don't want to do that. It's up to you to throw them out and some of which are going to hopefully spark ideas that we'll, we'll be able to craft a strategy around. Think of it as a skeleton, and you're going to begin to flesh it out. And so you'll be getting those towards the end of this evening. Then in between day one and day two, over the holidays, that we would like you, with representing and going back to your constituents, to your stakeholders, to come up with a strategy out of those cards. There's about 37 cards, I forget which total number. And what we tend to found, find is that people pick anywhere from 12 to 18 that represent what they think the future of Union Square should be. And we're gonna be, you know, there's, there's two levels to be thinking about this at. One is, this is a transformational plan you have here. This is going to be a big, change that's a generational change. This is a 30, 40 year kind of change. That's one level. Second level is that the implementation plans that we're also going to be discussing and, and we're going to be deciding upon, it's a three to five year implementation of that 30, 40 year plan. It's the bite size portion of it. And so it's going to you know, it's going to be a bunch of baby steps that we have to decide and this is the, the baby steps are what we're going to be asking you to take responsibility for. So, uh, and so then what we're asking for, and oh, and there's a whole series of processes, and Victoria and myself and Christopher will be making ourselves available at meetings and with conference calls to just touch base with you, see if you have questions, see if you want to bounce ideas off of us, and make sure that, that you're getting all the, all the information that you need to come up with this strategy. And we'd like to get them back from you, back from you by December 30th, because a lot of those strategy ideas are gonna to have to be priced out. We need to do some homework to figure out. So if you wanna engage in more affordable housing than the 20% that, that, that is already being committed to in the neighborhood plan, so what does that look like? What does that cost? How can we get that into the strategic planning process? Because again, you can't make strategy decisions without understanding the economics. And we want to be able to price those out, give it back to you, and then you make the uh, decisions. The, we're going to have two half-day sessions, starting at 5 o'clock on two back-to-back -back days, the 13th and 14th of January. The first half day on the 13th, and, and by the way, in parallel, this is something which, quite honestly, we've not been able to do until the last few years. We're going to have real-time fiscal analysis. The, the consultant that the city hired to do the fiscal impact study will be here on the 13th and 14th to answer your questions in real time about, okay, so we need some more money to, to pay for some of the community benefits. What, you know, how about if we do this? What, what will that result in as far as the fiscal impact? So you can begin to make those trade-offs because when, you're, when you don't have enough resources, you can either not 
do certain things or you make more money. Those are your options. And we'll have in real time the fiscal impact implications of the decisions that you come up with. And then, so the first day, the first half day is to, to really come to conclusions on what the strategy is. On the 12, 13, 14, 15, whatever, strategy cards that outline what you think the strategy should be. That's the first half day. Second half day is to figure out how do you implement it. And, and when I say how do you implement it, I'm not talking about some vague abstract you. As I mentioned earlier, it's you. Because this is going to lead to a discussion and, and a implementation question of who should be the place manager of Union Square. Right now, the Main Street program is the place manager, or is at least as close to it as possible. Place, um, I'm going to be giving you a little place management 101 uh, later on this evening, just so you understand the importance of place management in our society. It's a crucial, crucial thing. And the very fact that you have organizations like Union United is filling a void that has emerged over the last 20 years in our society, demanding place management. And so the, that second half day is focusing on implementation and figuring out ultimately how the place management organization will be, uh, will be developed, will be assigned, will be funded, because it doesn't do you any good if you don't fund it. With that, we will summarize that and get it back to you on paper. It'll be 8, 10, 12 pages. We're going to ask you, did we get it right? We're also going to pick a day, three, four months hence, when we'll come back together for a couple hours. And you will all have assignments that you'll volunteer for. And those assignments, we're going to ask you, so how well have you done? And in front of all your neighbors, you're going to respond. How well have you done on working on various aspects of the implementation? Because there's nobody else to do it but you. And we might have to do that again and again and again. And when I've done this in places like Chattanooga and Detroit, it went on sometimes for a couple years until the place management organization was in place. And their job is to quarterback and to be the keeper of the flame of the strategy of where you're going as Union Square as a place. So that's the basic process. Questions? Chris. Sorry. I have a question about the, um, whoa, okay. I have a question about the strategy cards. So I read over all the strategy cards before coming in here and it, it I'm confused because we've sort of been given already the set of things to choose from, um, which seems odd, like there were things that I was shocked to find were not in there. Uh, so, you know, how, how do we navigate that if there are things that we want to have be part of our strategy that are not just like haven't been included in your framework that you're imposing on the process? Either find a place for them or we'll make a new card. That, and this will make my strategy cards that much better. So open to absolute, complete, you know, A, throw them out because they don't apply, and some are obviously don't apply, but I want you to throw them out, or make new ones, or find where that, this is just meant to spark ideas. This is not meant to constrain at all. And, you know, new ideas, we are just, we're, we're only about 15, 20 years into this revitalization of place. So we're still learning. Joe mentioned about the fact, if you know urban history, we're just relearning what the ancients knew 100 years ago. So there's still a lot that all of us are, are, are learning. All of our places 100 years ago, virtually all of our walkable urban places, had vast mixed income, all within walking distance. Over the last 50, 60 years, we've been segregated like mad in this society. So we have to relearn what, what they did naturally. And it's kind of funny. I, I get to Europe quite a bit, and 
we in this country have all these funny names for it, smart growth and walkable urban places and all this stuff. And there was this Italian who said, you Americans, you have all these terms for this. This is just what we do. We have to get back to that too. So we have a new, new strategy card, make it. And, and we'll share it with everybody so that they can consider it too. Yes, Ben. And, and we will definitely, you know, you come up with a strategy card, everybody else needs to have that. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I'm going to forget to do that. Um, which I guess I want to talk to you later, just where, like, some of the, where you're getting some of this information. Because I would imagine, like, political risk varies from region to region, you know, city to city, things like that. Just to get a feeling of, is that a political risk here, not, you know, or somewhere else? Is, Change it. So I, that's what I'm trying to figure out is sort of where, when you wrote these things in, what was the, you know, sort of that assumption where would where it come from? This is, you know, the best knowledge we have as of when these things were made over many years, and it'll be improved by going through the Somerville process. So please, thank you. Yes, Stephanie. Um, either now or maybe at some point, can you explain how this process relates to the the master plan development, um, especially because the comments are closed at the end of November for that process? So, would the would the results of this these sessions inform the plan, or is it just a separate addendum? Or uh, it's sure better of, you know uh, inform the plan, and uh, um, that one of the things, for instance, when I mentioned that, what about if you need more revenues to fund community benefits and you want to make changes to the plan, um, that's what this process is all about. And so this is your job. Patrick. So this might be more for the city. It's come up at the CAC. Um, the plan, the comments are due at the end of the month, but we still don't have the fiscal impact analysis. We're going to have it. Right, but uh, the public is not going to have a month to comment on the plan with the fiscal impact analysis. My suggestion is that that deadline be extended. Chris, can I answer that? Uh, Go ahead, Ed. Fiscal impact uh, report is up online right now. We sent a copy of the way you copy of the impact and we sent it to all the CAC members. It will be, a, it will be available right now to so the CAC meeting on. I mean, at the, uh, at the register meeting on Monday, we, we fully expect to extend all the public comments. Thank you. On the Oh, and the plan, but and the and the entire plan. Uh, I'm going to let you speak to that, but at minimum on the fiscal. So I would just I would suggest they're related, mm -hmm. and a lot of people it's important to see both. Yeah, I understand that. It's <coughs> Any other comments from around the table, and then we'll go to the audience. Yes, Scott. Yeah. Um, so, just for clarity. I'm encouraged so far about what you've laid out today, frankly, but I'm still trying to understand what you've laid out today seems to be mostly geared towards developing a strategy and implement, you know, agreement around a strategy and implementation for a plan, for a plan that's already done somehow. Or are you trying to take this work over the coming months, you know, starting today, and sort of use it as a filter come to agreement on the plan, the neighborhood plan. It's an iterative process. It's got to go back and forth. Well, just, no, I, I agree. So, because it's a struggle in a way otherwise to be genuine about this if, there, if there's a feeling or a sense that there's already, that the plan is already assumed to be agreed upon or done. The neighborhood plan, I hear you. And so that's my concern that we, that we somehow all are assured that that this work, which seems quite excellent, um, is going to inform the outcomes of the plan and the specifics of the plan, as opposed to simply be responsive to or just be an implementation or strategy. Right. Madam, would you want to take it? You can't leave. is this process informing the neighborhood plan and that iterative process going back and forth? I, th 
think the, the best way to answer that is the draft that is before the public now is a living uh, uh, document. It's out for public comment now. We do have a, a uh, deadline for public comment, but you know, deadlines are made to be to, to be adaptable. The last thing that we want to do is to have anyone think that we're trying to uh, that we're trying to pull the curtain down on a document and a plan and a process that will really be a living, breathing uh, document. So, yes, I think the neighborhood plan, I think the zoning, and I think the locus uh, process we're all involved, that we're all involved in here all has to fit together, and I'm confident that it can and it will. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. So then, however, we should keep the comments on the plan open until we're, until we've gotten a little further along into this process and others. Can right? I do that? I don't think that's Great. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thank okay. you. Great. There's a comment back here? Yes. Um, Here's the speaking stick. And your glasses. Are these yours? No. <laughs> There was something I didn't hear um, that I want to bring up, which is that right now between Sullivan Station and Union Square, um, there is a huge amount of construction and it is almost impossible to walk into Union Square. And the piece that I think needs to be part of the strategic planning is bringing the city departments along in this process. Um, because the city does not yet have the management skills to deal with the change. And that needs to, it isn't a top-down process, it's an inclusive process, just as much as the residents need to be an inclusive process. Um, the streets and sidewalks are catastrophic. There is an effort to get them shoveled in the winter, but it, this needs to be part of the strategy. Citizen management of the sidewalks needs to be a piece of this. Um, the farmer's market is, I think, the only uh, event that is well managed really well managed. Because what I want to say is um, <coughs> Union Square is a bottleneck and a boondoggle. And that reality needs to be part of the very positive attitude that is here. That reality needs to be addressed. I think you just said something that really backs up the need for place management. There is nobody right now focusing on the personal experience of being in Union Square. From the street level, that we have folks from the city that are responsible for plowing the streets, not the sidewalks. The people that are responsible for the lights, but, and people responsible for public safety. And, but there's nobody that's focusing on the entire experience. That's why place management is so important. And this strategy is meant to put in place a place management organization that will take that comprehensive approach. It's, it's happening throughout the country. And it's what you just expressed better than I can. Herman. My question is uh, about the uh, place management. Uh, how that work, since we don't it's not exist right now. So uh, is the developer, is the community, uh, who will be in that? If, if, if you could wait for a couple hours, right after dinner, we're gonna be talking about that. So this is a nice lead in, thank you. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that and the experience we have throughout the country. Because this is not just an isolated thing, this is taking place throughout the country. Eric. I just want to say that that concept about missing interlinkages uh, within the city government uh, is not just about the built environment and the physical structure and not just about the long-term planning. A lot of people ask me about this process versus the CAC versus the SRA. 
the deed parcels versus Boynton Yards versus the neighborhood plans. There's so many overlaps and interlocking circles. Um, I, I think chaos it's great. It's it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that that's something that needs to be addressed at, at, at some point in terms of who, who's doing what and how and where are the overlaps and how these different organizations, what, what the various roles are. And as I say, there are examples throughout the country of organizations that are taking on not just the hard, you know, the hard infrastructure and but the soft infrastructure and the festivals and the and the planning and new project information coming out. It's happening. It can happen here. It's up to you. So if we can just in the back. In the back. Yes. Uh, I think we really want to also think about the civic presence in Union Square. That's going to make a big difference of how it's not going to be a commercial center like Assembly Square, but how it's going to be a publicly uh, a public center for people who feel they have ownership here because our institutions are represented there. Yep, and it, I mean, my experience throughout the country, throughout the world, is that this has got to be a place that is all about you know, representing you. It's the authenticity. It's coming up from the dirt of who you are. This is not a Huey helicopter dropping things. So that's what this process is about. That's what the place management will implement. And you'll help make that happen <laughs> individually. Yes, in the back. Can we make that other microphone work? <laughs> I've been listening to my labor neighbors and feeling this welling up of pride uh, that I live in a, I'm, I'm so blessed to live in a community with such wonderful, thoughtful, caring people and really understanding that I think what two people alluded to, uh, my answer to you about what makes Union Square special would be our sense of community. And 80% of us what I heard today it illustrates that what we share is so much more important than our differences. And um, those values are what inform goals. And strategy is how we realize goals in the context of finite resources and opposing forces. And as I understand what you presented here, the outcomes of this process are a strategy and an implementation plan. But the strategy, but what I also see up here is the neighborhood plan. And when I read the neighborhood plan, it's, it's much of its verbiage gives a nod to every value that's been stated here. But when, when it comes down to implementation, it's very much at odds with many of these values. So what happens if we come up with a strategy, if these my neighbors and people who I love and trust come up with a strategy that is at odds with the neighborhood plan. I can't guarantee anything. Um, and you'll find out when it, again, when you're looking at the financial implications of this, is where this is where the steel meets the road, uh, meets the track. So, wait. Uh, actually, Joe was performing. I have something below oh. me. Joe, please. You can't keep Joe down. <laughs> in, in the next month, the report will come out from the, from the um, Sustainability Committee on the transfer tax and a variety of other, other factors that are citywide but have direct relevance to the issues you're raising. And that's one other that I really strongly recommend that you distribute to everybody as soon as it comes out. The corollary of that is that there really are, there are all the resistant reports, there are all the other reports, there's a whole library of this stuff. Not only is it redundant, but it's often conflicting. And uh, it comes from very different directions. Uh, you're talking about actually pulling them together, but the difficulty is we don't even have an index of them yet. Okay? So that I really suggest that that be an early priority, is to create some kind of directory of stuff because there's a lot of stuff out here. Well, we're going to go through the briefing book and let's see if we've got, got a good majority.